Okay, thank you. Um, so finally now we've done some SRM and PRM and it's time to move into data independent acquisition. Um, so we're gonna just start with the very basics of how does DIA work. So just so I can think of how to pace this, if you could raise your hand if you're familiar with DIA and how it works. Okay, good, good. Oh, Brendan's familiar, yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, so, one way to think of uh, data independent acquisition that I kind of like uh, was something that Jim Bruce called it all reaction monitoring. So, the way I like to present DIA is it's kind of as if you're acquiring data that allows you to do SRM or PRM on every peptide in from one data run. So, you can go back to your data and extract these sort of SRM style traces from your data. And the, the means of quantification is very similar to SRM. It's based on extracted chromatograms. So I'll be kind of taking this from a targeted perspective. Um, so the basic way we, we do DIA in our lab is uh, we measure 20 mass to charge wide windows, although we do variations on this. But the basic idea is you just have a scan cycle of repeated wide, wind wide isolation window MSMS scans that together comprehensively cover a uh, wide mass to charge range. So this is to indicate that we're acquiring uh, comprehensive data on all of the precursors between 500 and 900 mass to charge, and we could later go on to extract uh, the fragment ion traces for anything in that range. Um, DIA is, uh, can be performed on any number of mass analyzers, uh, any type. Uh, today, um, the one that I normally use is Orbitrap, so I am We'll be focusing a little bit on the Orbitrap, but of course there's very successful applications on uh, frequently time of flight instrumentation as well. Uh, so when I talk about this comprehensive MSMS acquisition, uh, here's what I mean. So just more specifically, we're just acquiring a cycle of MSMS scans. So the reason this is called data independent is because we're not basing our MSMS scans on decisions based on something that I saw in MS1. So in DDA, we look in MS1 and we say, do I see a signal? Okay, well, I'm going to now do an a MSMS for that particular precursor. We're acquiring just a repeated cycle of MSMS completely independent of any information or any data in the MS1. So here's what that cycle looks like. Our first scan is gonna be a wide isolation window, MS2. So in this case, I've indicated it as a MS2 with a 20 mass to charge wide isolation window. And then the next scan will just be adjacent to that. So this next scan will cover 520 to 540 mass to charge. And we can just repeat this cycle. So by the time we get down to scan 20, we've now covered comprehensively this entire 500 to 900 mass to charge range. Uh, and on something like, for example, a Q-Exactive or any instrument, uh, most modern instruments, you can do this sort of thing at a scan rate of about 10 hertz, uh, which means that we sample a given window every two seconds, and that's an important aspect of data independent acquisition. We're gonna be extracting chromatograms from the data, so similar to how we've been talking about cycle time in the context of PRM, the same context applies for data independent acquisition. So in the case of something like a Q-Exactive, what's actually happening in the instrument is we have the mass, selection, the mass selection stage. So in this case, we're showing a selection from 780 to 800, this 20 mass to charge wide window. With such a wide window, we're always going to be isolating multiple precursors. So that's indicated by these different color lines. Uh, and we're gonna fragment these multiple precursors together. And in then in our case, we're gonna measure them on an Orbitrap mass analyzer. So we're taking these full scan spectra. And additionally, um, our lab, or I definitely advocate for throwing in an MS1 scan uh, into your cycle as well, because having the accurate precursor mass actually helps you uh, verify your peptide detections. And we'll get into this in a little bit more detail. Uh, are there any questions just on this, on this early slide? Okay, um, so some key things to remember here are that we're comprehensively sampling MS1 and MS2. So we're used to having this full range covered by an MS1 scan in DDA, but now we actually are also covering this full range with MS2 scans. Um, now when I zoom in on one particular isolation window, uh, 
we can see that, for one, it's untargeted, so the actual data acquisition is not targeted for anything. We use the same acquisition no matter what we're trying to look for. So what that means is that any given precursor will not necessarily be in the center of our isolation window. It could be anywhere in that window. Additionally, it's unbiased. So we're going to acquire an MS2, and we'll be isolating precursors of various different intensities. This is in contrast to DDA, where we're only going to be acquiring MS2 on preferentially high abundance or high intensity precursors, um, but we're, but by definition, only precursors that we can see in an MS1 scan. In DIA, we would acquire this window regardless of any information in MS1. And of course, as we need to stress and always remember with DIA, the drawback is these wide isolation windows. So now if we look at this in the time domain, so now I'm just going to say, look at these particular scans in order. Uh, one key aspect is that we've acquired this MSMS scan with the exact same measurement over and over, consistently over time. So what that means is with this consistent sampling, that's a requirement to extract chromatograms from the data. We've also done this with a frequency that's fast enough to extract a chromatogram. So what do I mean by targeted chromatogram extraction? So for example, in DIA, let's say I'm interested in this particular peptide that I've acquired in the data. Um, so the first step to extracting that, the information for this peptide from DIA is to determine what isolation window does it fall in. So in this case, 790.4 falls in this isolation window. And then to get information for that peptide, um, I'm going to be able to use the fact that we've sampled this window every two seconds, which means I can pull out chromatograms. And here's what that looks like. Um, so I'm going to show this three-dimensional plot, uh, and I'm going to show the stack of MS2 spectra. So we're acquiring these MS2 spectra over time, and these spectra contain signal for our peptide as well as signal for other peptides. So this axis here is the fragment ion, mass to charge. Uh, we're just only showing these par this particular spectrum with this precursor window. And this is retention time. So we've measured the stack of spectra. And we've extracted the particular signal from the, from the spectrum of interest. So in Skyline, what this looks like is you have a target list, and you have a particular set of Y ions in this case that we, we know the mass to charge, and we can then extract the signal from the spectra. Any questions on this part? Okay. Um, so what this looks like in Skyline is should be a very similar, uh, familiar workflow by now, is you decide what you want to look at, you decide what your target peptides are, and then we can extract chromatograms for those peptides, just like I showed before. So for example, for this peptide, we've determined we want to look at the precursor data. So remember that I had the MS1 spectra acquired in the workflow that I showed. And I can extract the MS1 chromatograms for the precursors. And then I also have now these MS2 chromatograms. So this looks just like what you would have for PRM, except we can do this sort of extraction for any peptide that we want within the isolated range. And then zooming in, the next part of the workflow is just like with any sort of chromatogram-based targeted experiment is we set peak boundaries and we integrate the peak. So this is why this is sort of SRM on all. So in contrast to SRM or PRM, where we only measure particular subsections of mass-to-charge space uh, repeatedly, in DIA, we've measured the whole region, and we can extract chromatograms for any particular precursor of interest. Um, so what does this look like as far as instrumentation? So this is going to show kind of a contrast between SRM and DIA, because I know a lot of people are familiar with SRM. So in SRM, we're measuring a targeted window that's centered on the precursor, whereas in DIA, the precursor is not necessarily centered in the window. And in SRM, we're doing a narrow isolation window, versus with DIA, we have this uh, wide isolation window. Um, the mass analysis in the case of SRM is using a mass filter. So we have 
and it's also low resolution, whereas for DIA, it's full scan, high res, accurate mass most often. So just if we look at what happens during acquisition, for SRM, we've defined our set of tr transitions before we actually start the run. And we're acquiring those transitions one at a time. So we only get information for those particular transitions as the, this shows the Q3 quadruple cycling through. And then we repeat this, this cycle over and over, and eventually we reconstruct a chromatogram. But with DIA, rather than targeted acquisition, we're doing targeted extraction. So here's just showing a measurement. So we've got this full MSMS -MS spectrum, but only some of the peaks in that spectrum are relevant to us. Only some of those peaks are for the peptide that we want. So here I'm showing with these gray boundaries, these would be the theoretical fragment ion mass to charges of interest for the peptide, and we can extract that information from the spectra. So over time, we acquire another full scan, and we just extract the information for the colored fragment ions that we care about. And then, of course, we just go through the, the standard skyline workflow of setting peak boundaries and integrating the peak. Any questions? OK. Um, so the advantages of DIA. Uh, one of the key advantages of DIA that I think gets a lot of people excited is when you consider doing data independent acquisition and the amount of labor you have to put in versus something like an SRM or a PRM experiment. So the steps in DIA, the first thing you do is data acquisition, whereas for SRM, data acquisition is down here. So here's what I mean by that. Um, for DIA, you can acquire your data before you have any idea of what you want to look for in your data. So let's say you have a particular hypothesis where you're interested in maybe some pathway. Maybe you think a, a drug that you're testing hits a particular pathway. Um, with DIA, you acquire that data. You then can select peptides for those proteins in that pathway, extract chromatograms, and do peak integration. Um, but the key difference is when after you test your hypothesis saying, does this drug hit this pathway of interest? Maybe now there's another pathway that becomes interesting once you've tested that. With DIA, you, th you don't need to go back and reacquire data. You just go back here and say, well, now I'll just extract peptides for my new hypothesis, for my new pathway of interest. If you had done that for SRM, uh, you, you would have had to design a method for your particular pathway of interest. Um, but gone through all of these, this method design of picking your peptides, potentially doing retention time scheduling, finding the optimal transitions, and then acquiring data. And if any of those things change, the particular transitions that you want to use or your scheduling, you need to fix it and then go back and reacquire data. So there's a lot of repeated acquisition with SRM, which we hope to get around with DIA by just acquiring one data set early in the process. Um, and then, of course, with SRM, in the example of a pathway, if we measured one pathway, found it interesting, and then we, we say you have some really important samples, and you might find yourself saying, oh, shoot, I wonder what this other pathway looks like in those samples. And in SRM, you wouldn't be able to go back and mine that data, but in DIA, you could. Any questions on that concept? Technical difficulties? Thing which um, come in the trap, uh, how are you managing the, the amount of ions going to the trap? Because we know that if we fill uh, with a lot of ions, mm -hmm. we, we, ha we will lose, uh, um, for example, the resolution on ions. Sure. Uh, we are not, uh, we don't have a currency. How do you manage with? Sure. So um, DIA is fully compatible with automated gain control, just like any other acquisition method. So with DIA, we do the same thing that we do for, AG for MS2 AGC, automated gain control, that we would with DDA, for example. So we are able to control the amount of ions entering the in this case, the, the trap, the orbit trap, to avoid space charging. And we can do that pretty successfully. So um, 
I mean, the, the classical way to do that is to do a fixed, very short fill time uh, precursor AGC scan where you then determine what your ion current is in that window. And then from that, you can determine how long to fill to hit your ion target. So in the case of, for example, the Q-exactive, the ion target is going to be to get one million charges in the trap. So um, we, we haven't had many issues with overfilling the trap. It does happen sometimes, but there are ways to predict the effect on the PPM shift. And we do find as far as the shifting in the mass that in general we fall within this, you know, the distribution of mass error is easily within 10 PPM on, on the orbit trap instrumentation. So we found that, that, yes, the wider window, you might have more ion flux coming in, but the already pre-existing AGC was able to deal with that just fine. <coughs> Any other questions? Okay, so now just to put um, DIA in context with SRM and PR PRM. So as far as isolation, the DIA is different, different from SRM and PRM. It's this wide window, whereas SRM and PRM both isolate in the same fashion, targeted on a particular precursor. Um, but then when we look at mass analysis, DIA is more similar to PRM, where it's both of these cases are measuring this full scan with the high-res accurate mass. So as far as the MS2 analyzer, we do gain some of the benefits uh, that we claim from PRM, which is the s improved selectivity due to high-res accurate mass measurements. So DIA is acquiring data that is both comprehensive and selective on a peptide mixture, which is why we're able to query it for whatever peptide we want post-acquisition. Um, so if we think about DDA, the MS1 scan in DDA is comprehensive. It's covering this wide range and all precursors in it are measured. The problem is that it's not selective. And what I mean by that is, for example, I took a particular MS1 precursor that I saw in a data set, uh, and it had a mass to charge measurement of 1312.6, and that was plus or minus 10 ppm. So if I just look in my database for like a database search um, at other potential hits, we see that we have other potential peptides that have a mass within that 10 ppm window. So when I say that the MS1 is not selective, it certainly is selective in some regard, but it's not specific enough to narrow down the identity of that peptide in this case. So I can't just look at an MS1 peak and say that's definitely the signal for my peptide. And of course, this is why we acquire MS2 data. So in this case of DDA, luckily, I sampled this peak and when I look at the X-core, that's the sequest score for a peptide spectrum match, I have a high X-core and now I know that this is the proper sequence for that peptide. But I needed the MS2 data to do that. So the MS2 data is selective, but in DDA, it's not comprehensive. I don't have it on every peptide. In DIA, the MS1 and the MS2 are comprehensive and we still maintain selectivity with MS2. Uh, with the SRM, we're selective for the MS2, but it's not comprehensive. Any questions or arguments on that? I like arguments, so if anybody wants to. <laughs> okay, so now the fun part, which is, uh, so I've talked about DIA, but why do we need it? Um, so we already have this DDA approach that's been very successful. Um, we're capable of identifying just astonishing amounts of peptides from a sample, and we're capable of quantifying them. So we have these database search algorithms that can identify peptides, and we have, we're pretty good at doing spectral counting for quantification or MS1 for quantification. So why in the world do we need DIA? And in my mind, the reasons for DIA's existence are that um, we can query the data for any peptide we want, which is important uh, if you're thinking in the context of hypothesis testing. And also, we're, we have more selective and sensitive quantification in a complex mixture when compared to MS1-based quantification in DDA. So imagine that, well, actually, this is what I was supposed to do um, during my grad school work, and I never quite got around to seeing this through, but I wanted to figure out um, why do we age? So why do we get old? And it's something that a lot of people are studying in one particular pathway of interest is the target of rapamycin pathway. Uh, so let's say in trying to figure out why we age, I look at uh, a set of wild-type yeast and a set of yeasts which are long-lived, which have this TOR1 knockout. 
And I'm interested in why are these TOR1 deficient yeast or TOR1 knockout yeast long lived? If I wanted to do a proteomics experiment in the classical workflow using DDA, um, the first thing I would do is acquire DDA on the blue and the red, and I would get this stack of peptide spectrum matches. So I have a list of identifications in both data sets. And then I would take those MS2 identifications and map them back to their MS1 features and do chromatogram-based, um, you know, label-free, I guess, in this case, quantification. Uh, and I can use a peptide spectrum match from the blue data and align it to the red with the retention time alignment. We have fairly, fairly sophisticated methods of doing this. Um, so let's say I did this, and now I've planted a little flag in all of the proteins, but really peptides that I have identifications for. The problem is that we only have an identification for a subset of these. So what if I'm looking at this pathway and I decide that for some reason I'm interested in lipin-1. And some of the questions that an experimentalist might ask is, is lipin-1 detected in the sample and does it change in abundance? And when I have DDA data, I just kind of raise my hands and say, I don't know. Um, and the reason is because I'm not sure what the reason is for not having an identification for lipin-1. It, we very well could have acquired an MS2 spectrum for it, but maybe it didn't give a confident hit in our database search. That doesn't mean it's not there. Um, maybe it's detectable in the MS1 data, but it was never sampled by MS2 because the instrument didn't have enough time to get to it. Maybe it's too low intensity. So what does DDA data miss? So this is, these are numbers from a graduate student, Han Yun Yang, in our lab. Uh, this is yeast on the QEHF. Um, this is just running DDA and asking the question of every MS1 feature that I detect, so uh, roughly 70,000 MS1 features. Um, how many of them are sampled by MS2? So 45,000 of them were sampled at some point by MS2. And how many of those features were then identified? So this is looking at um, features identified, not necessarily like um, PSMs or peptides, but what it's showing is that only 34, that 34 percent of the features are never sampled by MS2, and 86.7 percent of them are never identified. So this is kind of an extreme example, I would say, because I know that there's this, there's this thought of with modern instrumentation, particularly like the really fast scanning stuff, we can actually identify or at least sample every MS1 that we see, every, sorry, M every MS1 feature that we see by DDA. So we can sample everything. The issue is we don't necessarily get an identification for all of those things. And even if we sample everything, there's still features that are present in the MS2 data that do not have a signal in the MS1 data. And I'll show some of that later. So I would say that even if we sampled every single MS1 feature with DDA, there are still peptides that, are, that would have a signal in MS2 that are not being sampled. So quantifi quantifiable peptides that are not being sampled. Uh, and then our question is, what about life in one? Why wasn't it, why didn't we identify it? So maybe the MS1, maybe it's not detectable, or maybe it just wasn't sampled by MS2, which is a semi-random process. So, and then, of course, another issue is as we try to get down to lower and lower intensity, we have more and more trouble identifying things by DDA. I don't think that's really a surprise to anyone. So to hammer this home, um, this is the analogy I like to make. So let's say I walk up to a library and I'm interested in reading Harry Potter. So I want to know if a library has Harry Potter. So I'm ruining the surprise for you because Harry Potter's right there, the library has it. But the way you would approach this if you were using a DDA workflow, just stick with me here, is we would randomly select some books from the library. So we randomly choose some peptides, and then we read the spines of the books and we're able to figure out what a subset of those books are. So now we have this list of book identifications and we ask the question, is Harry Potter in there? and I walk out of the library without Harry Potter, even though it was in there, because I didn't randomly sample it or get an identification of it. So I've left with the false conclusion that Harry Potter is not in the library, it doesn't have it. Any questions on that, arguments? <laughs> I love this, because I really want arguments about this, because it's really fun. 
to go back and forth, and it's kind of, um, it's a little bit extreme, but uh, so what I'm trying to hammer home is that there's this difference between identification and detection. So we need DDA to come up with lists of identifications in a sample. So we can identify peptides and say, look, this peptide's in the sample, and that's useful. That means that at some point this protein open reading frame is translated, and that's interesting. But we already know all the proteins because we have a genome, so I'm a lot more interested in detection. So somebody who does, a DIA practitioner um, would say, okay, uh, let me figure out where Harry Potter would be in the library. So in this case, the library is alphabetized. Um, in the case of a peptide, it's organized by mass to charge. We already know the mass to charge of the peptide, so we know where to look for it. Um, we also oftentimes have prior information about retention time, so we know where to look. And in this analogy, we know where Harry Potter should be by, the, by, uh, by alpha alphabetizing, and we look directly for it. And we can ask the question and directly answer yes, Harry Potter was detected, so the library has it. So at least we know, we can directly ask, is this peptide detected or not? That's not the same as saying, is the peptide present in the sample? Because certainly peptides can be present and not detectable. But we can directly ask, is the peptide detectable based on our instrumentation? Any questions there? OK. So thinking about this idea of de detecting peptides directly from the DIA data. So what we're used to is this sort of spectrum-centric workflow, which is great for building a list of identifications. So we would acquire sort of DDA data, and we would use tools like Sequest or Mascot, and we would try to assign a peptide sequence to every one of these spectra. Um, and we're, what we're essentially doing is saying, what peptides best explain the data? For every spectrum, every set of data, we're saying, which peptide best matches, and are we confident in that peptide spectrum match? Um, in peptide-centric analysis, we're flipping this on its head. So this is the sort of analysis that um, Ludovic had in his SWOTH approach and has been really gathering steam in, in DIA. And it's uh, what I'm going to refer to as peptide-centric analysis, but I think we've made it pretty clear that in proteomics we like coming up with names. So this is not a concept that I'm claiming to invent. It's just something that I categorize it in my head. But what we're doing now is instead of starting with a set of spectra, we're starting with a set of peptides that we're interested in. And we can take those peptides of interest and we can extract information in them from information specific to them from the data. And we can say, what's my evidence of detection? So this would be showing for this particular peptide, here's the chromatograms I extracted. And then here is the amount of evidence that I have for that peptide at every point in retention time. So the evidence might be something like, how well do the chromatograms co-elute, the sort of scores that were discussed earlier in the session. Um, but we can come up with a score for the evidence for detection of the peptide in the data and assign a P or Q value directly to the detection of the peptide rather than to a peptide spectrum match. So then we, what, when we make these queries, what's returned to us is a p-value for the confidence and detection of that peptide for the particular peptides in your query. Any questions there before I move on? Okay. So um, in the McCoss lab, we've been working, or Sonia Ting, who made this slide, has been working on a tool for um, detecting peptides directly from DIA data. So I'm going to show some preliminary numbers from her now to get an idea of how we do relative to DDA. Uh, so this one is measuring a HeLa lysate, and she's querying it for 8,207 GST fusion proteins from the DNASU cDNA plasmid library. The reason she's querying for that particular subset is in the context of detection. We want to be able to validate our detections to test PUCON, to test this tool so we can actually synthesize the protein and make sure our detections are true. Um, in, one DIA in one DIA injection, so DIA measuring 500 and 900 mass to charge with these 20, 20 mass to charge wide windows, uh, we were able to detect um, 4,000 peptides that, that uh, map to these 8,000 proteins. 
Uh, with one DDA injection, we were able to detect 6,000. This isn't in the whole human database. This is just that map to these proteins. So for one injection, as far as sheer number of detections, DDA beats DIA in this case. But when we move up to doing two injections, so by two injections, I mean I'm going to split up this mass to charge range. I'm going to say do one DDA analysis on 500 to 700, then do another one on 700 to 900, just gas phase fractionation. So I see an improvement, um, a, a, a slight improvement in the number of detections um, by DDA, but with DIA, we now have these 500 by 700 mass to charge, and it's using 10 mass to charge wide windows, so the data is a lot cleaner. And we start seeing the DIA outpacing DDA. And then moving on to four injections, we see even more. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that perhaps DIA will benefit more, and this is something we've seen, from doing multiple injections. So we've had a lot of success with being able to detect um, a lot of peptides if we're willing to do multiple injections with DIA. And of course, as instrumentation gets faster, we can start getting the data we would have gotten in two injections in one. Uh, so I've been kind of talking about peptides that would be uh, something we can see in DIA, but not DDA. And the reason would be that if we take this protein and we look at the signal for some of these peptides. So this is the MS2 data over time. We can see we have a pretty messy signal, but there is a signal for the peptide. Um, and the reason we didn't detect it in DDA is because if you look at the precursor, there's basically no signal for it. So we don't see anything in the MS1, but it's still something we can see in the MS2. And that shouldn't be a surprise after hearing sort of the things that Bruno talked about. The MS2-based quantification is more selective. Uh, in a complex mixture that makes them more sensitive than the MS1. So we're able to see a signal there, and we would have never sampled this by MS2 in DDA because of the lack of precursor. And this is actually the case for a lot of the peptides in this protein. So here's a great example where we see a really good signal for the MS2, um, but very weak for the MS1, uh, and so on and so forth. There, these peptides are certainly down in the noise, but keep in mind that we're also plotting a ton of transitions. So if I narrowed it down to the five cleanest transitions, the data would look a little cleaner. Uh, is it possible that there was some kind of very label modification, like glycosylation on this peptide, that you look at for the wrong precursor or something? Yeah, so that could be the case. Um, I think it would, it would probably be unlikely for this many peptides in the protein, but that is something that you that is a very um, important issue to keep in mind with DIA. So in, with a lot of modifications, you'll actually co-isolate a peptide and its modified form uh, together in the same isolation window. And that can actually cause you to see an MS2 signal that looks very similar to the unmodified peptide. And without the MS1, it can be challenging to know the difference. Uh, so I actually think I have some slides on that. Um, let me see. Oh, I suppose I don't hear it. Oh, no, I do. So I'll, I'll discuss that, actually, um, in about five minutes. Oh, any other questions on this? Yeah. So I'm going to play devil's advocate, but uh, if you, I don't know what's how long you acquire your MS1 signal. So, I mean, there has been a lot of discussions, you know, like in I mean, we have seen the same if we put the same accumulation time in MS1 and MS2, but if you push a bit accumulation time in MS1, you might still retrieve quite few precursor detections. Is it Sorry. acquired with the same accumulation time, or are you also pushing a bit the MS1 in this case? So in this case, the MS1 and the MS2, remember, in this case, we're doing this on a trapping instrument. So we have the same AGC target for, the b for both, right? So the MS1 signal is going to always fill the trap to 1 million ions. In DIA, we're also filling for 1 million. In this particular case, the reason why um, we can get more sensitive for DIA could be that for MS1, we're using this 1 million ions for this wide mass to charge range, whereas for DIA, we're using it for just this 20. But also keep in mind the DIA signal is divided up amongst multiple peaks, whereas the MS1 is all in a single peak. Like yeah, <laughs> we have the capability. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, so this is another example. This is kind of just driving home. Bruno already covered this really well. So uh, with the MS1, 
we can see that as we go down in concentration for this spike in, the MS1 has a, a ton of chemical noise in this particular case, which is making it such that we can't uh, quantify this peptide well, whereas in the MS2 signal, uh, we're more selective, so we have uh, still a decent signal for our peptide in this case with some interferences outside, but much less interference on the actual peptide itself. And with that improved selectivity, we see an improvement in sensitivity uh, in a complex matrix. So this is looking at a spiking experiment where we spiked in 26 peptides into a yeast matrix. And what I'm plotting is the lower limit of quantification for those peptides. Uh, so here's the benchmark for MS1. We're seeing uh, seven, about seven femtomoles for MS1 with the DIA experiment using the top three transitions. Uh, with just the standard workflow, we can get down to uh, 4.8, but when we use this demultiplexing approach, which I can detail later, um, it's just a modified DIA approach. It doesn't require any extra injections or anything like that. We can get down to a uh, three, uh, threefold improvement in the sensitivity. And these uh, numbers for lower limit of quantitation, these are actually calculated with um, a novel algorithm that we'll also be publishing on that explains how we calculated lower limit of quant. Okay, so the promise of DIA is that we're acquiring this molecular image or a digital archive of the sample, which we can then mine over and over again. And keep in mind that we do not have to do any scheduling. There's no retention time scheduling in DIA, and that makes me extremely happy in particular because the last few nights I've been waking up to reschedule my PRM runs. And I can tell you that this makes me really happy that there's no scheduling with DIA. Um, we can directly query our data for peptides of interest and get a p-value for those particular peptides. And we also get, in a complex mixture, better quantitation than DDA. So what are the challenges? So we're saying that we're acquiring this comprehensive image, which is fantastic, but if the image looks like this, we're not very interested. It's like, great, you measured everything, but you did a terrible job of it. Um, so what are the challenges in DIA? So this is what I was referring to the, the previous question with modifications. This is an issue. Um, let's say we have, in this case, we're querying for this peptide here, and it has this methionine, right? So we see these two peaks for when we query the transitions for this peptide. And one of the peaks is the peptide of interest, um, but this one here looks very similar and the reason it looks similar is because it's actually the same peak, but with an oxidized methionine. So if you were doing a PRM experiment, you would not have this problem because the two precursors are spaced apart. Uh, I think it's triply charged, so what is it? 5.3 mass to charge apart. They would be sampled, and, and they would not be co-isolated together. But in the case of DIA, we've actually isolated this precursor here on the left side of the window, and 5.3 mass to charge away, the the version with an oxidized methionine. And when you co-isolate those, they also share, in this case we're looking at Y ions, they also share the exact same Y ions up to the oxidized methionine. So when we extract the signal, we see that we have these fragment ions with the exact same mass to charge. Of course, they're resolved in this case by the retention time, and they're also resolved if I showed the MS1 information, hopefully we would have a precursor signal for this one and not this one. But this is the sort of challenge that we have with acquiring uh, DIA data. It's the issue of these wide isolation windows is what really hurts us. It's more specifically the loss in precursor selectivity due to the wide isolation windows. Um, so this, is, this was the focus of, of a lot of my graduate work. Um, I did a lot of kind of like multiplex methods to help overcome this. Uh, I'm not going to talk about those right now, but I'm open to any questions about it later. Uh, peak picking is also challenging with DIA data. So DIA data does tend to be messier than um, PRM or SRM data. So it's kind of stretching our ability to pick peaks a little bit more. Uh, if we look here, you know, this peptide is certainly there when you zoom in on it. But when you look at the full chromatograms, it's kind of a mess, and you can imagine that it's challenging to do manually and even more challenged to do automatically. So this is kind of why we have an advanced peak picking tutorial, because these sorts of tools become very important uh, in the context of DIA data. And also new algorithms. So in our lab, we have this pecan algorithm where we're detecting peptides directly from DIA, but also the use of spectral libraries where we know the retention time and we know the fragment ion information. 
those same concepts apply to helping pick peaks in DIA data. We can also do the sort of M profit style of generating decoys from and using spectral library information. Additionally, with more noise, we also stress the, uh, the automated peak Question. integration. Oh, sorry. Uh, could you please come back to the, uh, yeah. Uh, for example, for um, DA, we have spectrum library. In this case, could you please show us, for example, a spectrum library if since um, the, um, the figure in the top, we have an identification, yeah? Yeah. Uh, how it looks, uh, the, the spectrum of SWAS, for example. Oh, oh, like the, the full, so you're talking about not the spectral library spectrum, but the actual MS2 spectrum itself. The full, the full DIA spectrum, right? Is uh, that MS2, you, uh, I mean. So there's, so there's two MS2 spectra here that are at play. So one is, you're right, you're right that in this case, we're using information from DDA to help us pick the peak. So we have these spectra that, we, that were identified in our spectral library. And we found that we have these identifications from the spectra that overlap here. So those spectra would likely look fairly clean. Um, but then if we looked at the actual DIA spectrum, which is what we've extracted these chromatograms from, it's going to be a bit messier, or even a lot messier, because we've used this wider isolation window. Um, and I think I, I do have some slides on that. OK, this is where I get into that. So this question of image quality, of DDA versus DIA versus SRM. Uh, so uh, with DIA, we're doing what I say is this MSMS quantification on everything. So it's like measuring uh, with MSMS, which is selective and sensitive. SRM and PRM, we have these high selectivity MSMS quantification. And with uh, DDA, we're using this less selective and a little bit less sensitive MS quantification. Uh, but that's not the whole story. Uh, with SRM and PRM, we're only doing this on a subset of the targets. So we get great gold standard measurements, but we're only seeing a small subset of the data. With DDA, we're, we're acquiring this, but on a semi-random subset, and for DIA, we're doing it, but hopefully on the most interesting part of the image. So we don't acquire everything. In my case, I'm doing 500 to 900 mass to charge. Um, so there are peptides outside that range, which is why I'm not saying that we're acquiring the whole Mona Lisa. Um, but another interesting to think about thing to think about is as instruments get faster, um, we're going to be doing DDA, and we're going to be acquiring more and more MS2 spectra, and at some point, it's just going to be a jumbled mess, and we'll be saying, why didn't I just acquire DIA with two master charge wide windows? So if you don't like DIA now, I think in the future it might be your only option. Although that's a bit of an exaggeration, because what, what people in reality have been able to do with DDA and where it still fits is really well is actually when you want to run really fast gradients. So a lot of people haven't have said, well, I have a faster scanning instrument, so now I can reduce my gradient length by half and still get a load of IDs. Whereas if you make your gradient faster, your peaks get narrower for DIA, and the, the technique becomes a little more limited. So yeah, at some point, DIA will be a no-brainer, I guess, in my mind. Um, so that's all the slides that I have. Um, I apologize. I thought I had the, the slides showing the different, the more complex spectra for DIA versus DDA. That's actually in the talk on Friday. So I thought it was part of this one. Um, so I apologize for that. And it looks like I ran uh, pretty early. So do we have any, any questions? Sure. So the, the range between 500 and 900, there's yeah. not, uh, the distribution of peptides is not uniform. Uh, so did you also try making windows wider at the extremes? So that, that is an approach that, is that some people have done, and I've tried it. Um, in my case, I didn't see much benefit from doing that. So I think what you're saying is that the distribution shows that most of your triptych peptides are kind of going to fall in this region between 500 and 900 is what I'm saying, but you have kind of a you know, a, a hump distribution. So the idea could be that in the more complex regions of the distribution, you want to acquire narrow isolation windows and then wider ones on the outskirts. 
So that is an approach that people are doing. I actually forget which instrument vendor is doing that approach, but Cyx. okay, Cyx is doing that approach. Um, in my hands, you know, I only tried it once a while back, and I didn't find much of an improvement. Um, what I've found is that by doing 500 to 900, I keep it simple, kind of, but also uh, it's not necessarily getting every particular peptide for a protein. It's just that I need one or two that are, I guess, what we've called quantitypic, right? So I would try, I would move to focus on kind of a smaller mass to charge range and make sure I measure all of those peptides as best I, that I can. Good question. Is there already any publication about that direct uh, data analysis of the data independent acquisition? Because I have the feeling that until now, most of in most of the cases, we are forced to use a library to yeah. extract the data, and then we are at some point limited to the proteins which are in the libraries. Sure. Uh, so. Yeah. I didn't see so uh, any publication of that pecan. I heard it a bit at the UPO last year, but it's still really new, no? Uh right, so it's a, the publication isn't out yet. Um, it's a work in progress. Um, she's been developing it, but it can take a while to publish things, I suppose, so that's, that's been the limitation there. As far as the ability to detect things without a spectral library, though, the Neshvisky lab has a tool out that's called DIA Umpire. Yeah. Uh, it's spelled D-I-A-U-M-P-I-R-E. Um, and the approach of DIA umpire is to look for co-eluting uh, fragment ion peaks and then extract just those peaks and basically it converts DIA data into something that you can use for a spectral library, or sorry, for a standard database search pipeline. Well, actually, you, you can use mascot or something like that to directly analyze your, your data or... Yeah, if you... If if you first do this step of finding the co-eluting fragment ions. So if you tried to take DIA data itself and search it directly with the database search algorithm, it would be a mess. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but what you can do is since we know what the, we know the signature, we know what the signature of, a, of an actual peptide looks like. We know that when we see fragment ions co-eluting, they likely all came from the same peptide. So what the, al what the DIA umpire algorithm will do is it'll look through the DIA data first and find cases where we have these co-eluting fragment ions, and then it will take just those co-eluting fragment ions and make a, make a pseudo spectrum from just those fragment ions, right? So that's now a very clean spectrum just from co-eluting ions, which then can be plugged into a standard database search algorithm. So uh, I, I've actually talked to Alexi about it a, a, a bit, and um, they're actually using precursor in information as well. So sure. uh, it's so they they're I mean, uh, contrary to what you're you're showing with pecan, they would not they would not uh, generate right, a pseudo spectrum for anything that doesn't have good MS1 signal. Good um, point. But otherwise, it's very it's very similar to what uh, Waters has been doing with MS to the E. You know, for with PLGS, the, their their product for yeah. So you generate pseudo spectra, but he, but he is like talk to Alexi. He's very he's very convinced that there is good MS1 data at least in the way they're collecting their MS1 data. And maybe he's using some of what what Ludo is talking about. Uh, for every every spectrum that they generate, there's there's a a, a noticeable MS1 peak. So. In the front. But where would you then draw the line between uh, analyzing uh, DIA data with the spectral library or PECAN or any uh, other algorithm and analyzing DIA data via uh, peak picking, uh, manual peak picking and skyline? So I can tell you that um, manual peak picking of DIA data without any prior information is extremely challenging and I would definitely advise against it. So it's very difficult to choose the correct peak in the first place um, if you, as I've shown in some of those chromatograms, are very messy. Even if you do that, the next challenge becomes how do you, dis how do you prove to yourself that that's actually the correct peak? Um, because we've co-isolated so many things. There's the decoys. It's very likely that peaks that you pick by yourself might not be true, might not be correct. So 
to, to analyze DIA data without a spectral library, we really need a good statistical framework to assess um, our false, our, uh, how, what's the probability of that peak being incorrect. And that's sort of the, the stuff that Sonia has worked on with Pecan, is it actually does do this sort of uh, similar, similar idea to what was presented earlier of you extract information for your peptide of interest and then you create a decoy and extract that information calculate scores for both, come up with distributions, and assign a, a false discovery rate. Um, but I would definitely caution against just looking at your DIA data, seeing a peak, and, and being okay with it. Because uh, unlike something SRM or PRM, it's a little bit less of a stretch because you've really narrowed in on that particular target. But for DIA, you'll find that it's very frequent that you'll have two potential peaks and you'll have no clue which is the best one. Okay. But even if I uh, want to have a, I have a, um, imagine that I have a list of interesting yeah. proteins uh, from a bacterium, maybe like four to 10,000 proteins, no one will have a list of 10 to 10,000 peptides or proteins, even more peptides to manually look on, then uh, you would go for a spectral library. Correct. S and for smaller data sets, let's say for what, just, 100 proteins, and you would rather wouldn't then you rather go for a PRM assay uh, instead of a sure. PIA assay? Sure. That's that's um, so a lot of a lot of good points to make there. So um, when you're looking at something like 10,000, yes, you you absolutely need the DIA. And again, like I would always caution against doing a manual analysis with DIA. You can still use um, a spectral library to look for things. You can also do manual analysis in something like Pecan once the paper is published to look at those 100 things in the DIA data. PRM is definitely expected to give you better quantification than the DIA if you have a set of 100 peptides. So if you absolutely want your best quantification, PRM is your best bet so long as you can fit your list of targets into a single analysis. But do keep in mind that when you do that PRM run, you lose this comprehensiveness. So I know there's a lot of, a lot of people come to be interested in DIA because they've had the experience of measuring some samples with PRM, and then two years later, they're like, oh, I wonder what this other set of peptides look like in that data, and you can't do it. Whereas with DIA, you can. So the way to kind of put those, keep those in your mind is DIA, you're trading a little bit your ability to do quantification. It's not going to be as good as PRM in, in almost every case. Um, but you're gaining this ability to go back, and your data is now generalized, right? So you, it's, you can query it for whatever you want. Thank you. Yep. There's a question here. Uh, so you showed that uh, this uh, spectra are quite messy for DIA at the moment, at least. And uh, how does it stand with sensitivity, especially comparing to uh, SRM or PRM? Sure. So uh, let's do the PRM comparison. So that's a fairly a little bit more of an easier comparison to conceptualize. So there are two things that can that can impact your sensitivity. Uh, let's start with selectivity. So let's imagine we're doing, um, we have a particular analyte of interest and we measure it with PRM and then we measure it with DIA. With PRM, we're just isolating this two mass to charge wide window around the analyte, right? So when you've only isolated that two mass to charge wide window, you have less chance for creating interference in your signal. You have less, less time, or it's gonna happen less frequently that your co-isolate something that creates interference in your chromatograms for your peptide. Whereas for DIA, you now have a 10 times wider window. You're much more likely to fragment a precursor that both co-elutes and shares some fragment ions in common and thus creates interference. So that's one reason why PRM will be more sensitivity as, um, directly, as a direct result of the better selectivity. The other thing is this is gonna be a little bit more specific to ion trapping uh, instrumentation. But keep in mind again, that if we're doing this on an orbit trap, let's say we're filling the trap for PRM and we're filling it for DIA. For PRM, we've filled up, we've acquired one million charges, but let's call it ions, one million ions, uh, and we filled that up for just this two mass to charge wide window. Whereas DIA, we've used that one million ions and we've spread it out over 20. So the most obvious case where that would really hurt you is let's say you have your analyte of interest, this thing, okay? And then we have some interference that's really high, okay? So in PRM, we're just isolating this analyte. In DIA, if we co-isolate it, 
that means that in this one million ions, maybe we got one e to the fifth for this analyte, and therefore a very small number for the analyte of interest. So that's kind of, I guess, a dynamic range issue that you run into. Uh, have you ever tried uh, putting the uh, DIA MS2 spectra into mass code directly or doing some second search things? Yeah, so. You identify patterns? Yeah, so oh, you'll identify some, <laughs> just <laughs> not a lot. Um, so, so that's, uh, there's kind of two prevailing approaches, I think, for trying to detect peptides in DIA data. So what you've just described is something that a few people have tried, which is doing a spectrum, what I would call a spectrum-centric approach, but changing it a little bit for DIA. So you can do very clever things. Like one way is you have your DIA spectrum, right? And you get a peptide spectrum match for it. And then you remove the peaks for that one and you search it again. So that's like kind of an iterative algorithm. Another way is when you, rather than taking your spectrum and looking through a single peptide for each one, like you, in, in like normal database search, you have your spectrum, you look at each peptide in your database and say which matches better. Um, very intelligent computer science people have able, been able to expand the algorithm to say, look for every combination or look for combinations of two or three peptides and see which best describes the spectrum. And that has uh, given improved results as well. So it is possible to look at DIA in the context of spectrum-centric approach. I guess the other approach would be like converting it, like we were talking about with the MS to the E kind of DIA umpire style algorithm, which is like extracting a non-convolved non signal from the spectra and then database searching it. And then there's approaches like the, the swath style, the kind of open swath style approach and the pecan approach that uh, base it completely off chromatograms. I would uh, have a question about collision energy. So for yeah. SRM analysis, you would probably uh, uh, optimize collision right. energy Very for each question. and every peptide. How would you do it for DIA? You wouldn't. <laughs> so um, that's one of the caveats. So in my next lecture on Friday, I'll, I'll, I'll be covering this, um, where I kind of talk about more of the challenges in designing the DIA method. But this is a very good thing to bring up. Um, and that's that. When you're doing uh, an SRM or PRM algorithm, you're able to target your collision energy based on maybe an optimization you did empirically, but at the very least, based on the mass to charge and charge state of the peptide. Uh, with DIA, we certainly can't do any sort of optimization based on the charge state, uh, because in this window, we don't have a particular target of interest, and we're co-isolating peptides with singly, doubly, triply, quadruply charged. So if we're optimizing for one peptide, we're by definition unoptimizing for another. Uh, so what I do in DIA is I just do, uh, I just assume doubly charged. Um, so that is, is one drawback and one reason that you could have uh, better sensitivity with a sort of PRM approach, for example. Um, I actually got a question regarding fractionation. So what many people do in DDA, for yeah. instance, is to fractionate yes. to increase the number of IDs. Uh -huh. Um, do you think it's a valuable option for DIA? So would you fractionate for DIA analysis or would you advise against it? Um, so, I mean, fractionation will benefit you in either case, certainly. And what we've actually found success in doing with DIA is rather than uh, doing your sample fractionation up front, we rather just, we find that when we do a narrow DIA approach, so I've been showing this 20, 20 mass to charge wide windows, right? We're able to increase our, our ability to detect peptides markedly in DIA when we just say, let me do multiple injections of the same unfractionated sample and essentially do the fractionation in the gas phase in the mass spectrometer. So we actually say, let's say I'll be happy with doing 12 injections and each one will measure 25 two mass to charge wide windows. So that's kind of like doing PRM on everything almost. I mean, that's a stretch, but you're doing these two mass to charge wide windows and 25 of them in each run, and then running something like pecan. And when we've done that on, for example, it was done recently, let's see, on Gila, uh, we got, I think it was, it was definitely more than 20,000 peptide detections just from the 500 to 700 mass to charge range. So we found great success doing that. Um, we ha I haven't tried it um, with fractionation yet, though. 
um, on your slides, you showed very interesting summaries on each of these techniques. Yeah. I would like to know your opinion on the future application of each of these techniques in routine clinical analysis. Oh, clinical analysis. <laughs> I guess if you want a very uninformed opinion, uh, I can offer one. Um, I mean, I, no, you know what, it's, it's just silly for me to even comment because I really have no idea what, it, what, what are the requirements for a clinical analysis. I just don't have a lot of, a lot of exposure to that. Um, so I just, I don't think I can give a very informed answer, to be honest with you. Like, I can tell you academically where, where I think they would go. And uh, I know one thing is that um, we have, like, clinical assays that have used DDA, so um, for, uh, oh, shoot, I don't even remember. But I know that <laughs> people, I know that targeted approaches can, in my mind, gain better traction because one drawback of DDA for a sort of clinical analysis, especially if you're using spectral counting, is this irreproducibility issue when you're sampling. So you might measure a sample three times and get different identifications, and I know that that can be an issue, whereas a targeted approach, you're at least honing in directly on your analyte of interest. Um, another thing that's really interesting for DIA is that works well is that you are acquiring kind of this molecular image of the sample. So that's very good if you're thinking about working with patients and having kind of this, this diagnostic data on them. So if you had, for example, blood samples, like dried blood spot samples, for example, you could go back and look at your DIA data that you acquired later on, maybe even post-mortem, and get an idea for for um, you would have this data over time to help you maybe figure out what went on. So that's my completely uninformed opinion, and sorry for wasting your time. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. And we would like to thank Jared, and we'll hear him again on Friday. And the next talk is. <laughs> the next talk is going to be upstairs. <laughs>